this is the third day of talks. I think uh, previously we had um, Dr. Matthew, Dr. Jai Surya, Dr. Girish, and I think Dr. Paolomi also, and we enjoyed those talks and those interactions. Today, I think the, the talks are going to be more about uh, adolescents, youth, and mental health, and also about parents and the role they have with children. Our first speaker is Dr. John Vidyasak. Um, so Dr. John Vidyasakar is currently the professor and head of the Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Unit in Nimhans. He's finished his MBBS from uh, SV Medical College, Tirupati, and he's done his MD in Nimhans in Psychiatry. He's been a senior resident at CMC Bello and at JIPMA, and he's won a fellowship with the Indo-US for Gati, the Indo-US for Gati uh, Fellowship at the University of Florida. He's had 20 years of experience as a psychiatrist and 11 years of experience as a child and adolescent psychiatrist. He's published numerous research articles and chapters in books and has many uh, research pro uh, projects with um, ICMR, ICSSR, Tata Trust, and so on. He's also a member of the Technical Resource Group on Adolescent Mental Health, Government of India. So we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. John Vidya Sagar with us here today. And uh, he will tell us about how to look for mental health issues among adolescents and youth whom we may be interacting with. Uh, sir? Uh, so uh, a very good afternoon to all the participants. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Madhurini, for the uh, kind words of introduction and at the outset I would like to thank uh, Samagra uh, for this wonderful uh, initiative uh, in bringing uh, these webinars uh, on uh, mental health uh, during these difficult times and uh, I would say that it's a learning exercise for all of us. Uh, so uh, these kind of opportunities actually uh, helps uh, all of us to learn uh, more and more and about mental health. Uh, and uh, as we all know, it's an important component of uh, one's health. And uh, during these difficult times, it helps us to support our uh, uh, near and dear ones and also uh, people whom we serve. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, Professor Matthew Varghese uh, uh, for uh, you know, coordinating with uh, Samagra and uh, uh, motivating all of us uh, mental health professionals at NIMHANS to uh, basically chip in and present these uh, topics. And uh, today's session, uh, uh, I'm also happy to uh, be uh, uh, joined by my uh, colleague and uh, Dr. Shreyoshi Ghosh, who is a National Professor of Child and Nursing Psychiatry. And uh, uh, her topic is very important, role of parents in the time of pandemic. So first I will start uh, with, uh, uh, let me sh share the screen. So uh, the topic uh, for today's uh, uh, first webinar, uh, first uh, session is early identification of mental health problems in adolescents as well as the youth. And, uh, so, uh, this is the place where uh, me and Shreyoshi work. So it's uh, our uh, child psychiatry uh, center on the left side and the adolescent psychiatry center on the right side of the slide. And, uh, mental health, uh, as we all know, is a key component of a person's uh, ability to function well in their uh, personal as well as social lives. And uh, it is uh, essentially uh, how a person uh, develops and uses strategies to cope with uh, life events which they encounter throughout the lifespan, right from their childhood to the uh, elderly period. Also, uh, we know that uh, when a person has uh, good mental health, it helps uh, them with uh, unraveling or unlocking several uh, social advantages and even the health advantages. And we know that uh, the physical health uh, is directly impacted by the mental health. Any adverse impact on the mental health, uh, it uh, 
adversely impacts the individual uh, in such a way that they are not able to reach their uh, full potential. Uh, just a few facts and figures before uh, we move on to the mental health issues. So uh, the common age definitions that are used for adolescents as well as youth, I have mentioned on this slide, uh, 10 to 19 years for adolescents and uh, youth, uh, it is mentioned in the literature as 15 to 24 years. However, uh, the recent literature has shown that the period of adolescence uh, can stretch uh, from almost uh, 9 to 10 years onwards to uh, the age of 24 or 25 years because uh, it's an important phase of transition between that of childhood as well as adulthood. And a lot of uh, uh, changes happen in the individual, uh, both at the psychological level as well as uh, the biological level. And especially when we talk about the biological changes, there are a lot of uh, neurobiological changes uh, happening in the brain, uh, mainly in terms of maturation of the human brain. And uh, during this period, uh, there is uh, increase in the uh, brain networks that happen, uh, networking of all the neurons in the brain, uh, the nerve cells in the brain. Uh, to uh, Comparatively, when we compare that to the childhood, it uh, is to a much greater extent, this networking. And also uh, the brain maturation uh, goes on from uh, 10 years of age onwards to almost 24, 25. So uh, though we uh, definition wise, we say that by 18 or 19 years, the person enters into adulthood, uh, but the brain changes, they continue till the 24 or 25th. Uh, so well into the second decade of the person's life. And uh, we see that uh, our country especially has the highest number of uh, uh, persons in this age group with about 356 billion, uh, uh, despite having the overall smaller population size compared to the country like China. And uh, most of the uh, young people live in low and middle income countries like India. Also, it has been shown that uh, the onset of uh, most of the mental health uh, disorders are uh, prior to the age of uh, 14 years, almost half of uh, all the lifetime mental disorders start in the adolescent age group. And another uh, worrying kind of uh, uh, fact is that 90% of the adolescents in the low and middle income countries, they do not receive any specific intervention for the mental health. So I talked about some of the neurobiological changes uh, in the brain. So this is just a depiction of those changes. As you can see from the age of uh, five years, uh, to that of almost the second decade, that is 20 years, the brain continues to mature. Uh, different areas of the brain, uh, they continue to mature and uh, especially the, uh, there is an area in the brain called the frontal lobe, uh, which is involved in control of one's own emotions and uh, planning, organization, uh, reasoning abilities, judgment, problem solving skills, etc. So the frontal areas of the brain, uh, they mature during the latter part of the adolescence period. That's why we see that, uh, especially in the early adolescence and middle adolescence period, uh, many young people, they uh, don't have control over their emotions and uh, they have difficulty in planning and organizing uh, activities and also in problem solving capabilities. By the time the late adolescence gets over and uh, uh, they are uh, entering into the uh, 24 or 25 years of age, uh, the brain is much more mature and they are able to, uh, from, of course, from the life experience also, they are able to learn much more uh, to practice uh, these skills. So, uh, as I mentioned in uh, my initial uh, comments, the uh, new age of adolescents that has been depicted in this slide from about 10 years of age to 25 years. And, uh, then let us move on to some of those uh, uh, numbers, uh, wherein what is the prevalence of these conditions? Uh, a recent uh, Indian survey, pan-national survey, which is uh, titled the National Mental Health Survey, uh, conducted in the year 2016, uh, had showed that uh, it was uh, sponsored by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It has uh, reported that the prevalence is about 7.3%. It was found in this survey that uh, 
both boys and girls are almost equally affected and uh, the prevalence is more uh, in the urban uh, metro areas uh, metropolitan cities uh, followed by the larger urban uh, followed by the other urban centers and uh, then the rural areas and among these conditions the mood disorders and anger disorders are said to be much more common and uh, uh, as i mentioned 90% they don't receive intervention and there exists a large gap in the mental health needs of adolescents and youth uh, this we call it as mental health gap uh, this exists even for the adults with regards to the mental health problems but uh, this gap is more uh, wide or large in uh, children and adolescents and uh, these uh, disorders can cause long term adverse outcomes uh, in mental health physical health social functioning as well as the economic aspects so uh, when whenever uh, we talk of uh, adolescents or uh, children uh, we definitely have to understand uh, this perspective which is a lifespan perspective as you can see in this pictorial depiction uh, so right from the uh, the risk factors uh, for these kind of problems they start right from the antenatal period uh, or the prenatal period uh, right from the time the mother becomes pregnant at that time uh, factors like maternal stress or mother uh, getting affected with any infections or mother having any uh, medical conditions like hypertension diabetes so all these things can have an impact on the developing fetus and the fetal brain development can get affected because of this adversely and also once the child is born and the child goes through the childhood and later into the adolescence and early adult life and mid life etc so you can see that uh, the risk factors uh, they uh, continue and they interact with the, some of the environmental kind of exposures for example now for all of us the important environmental exposure is the a uh, situation that has been caused by the covid-19 pandemic so uh, if the person has a genetic predisposition to develop uh, say a depression a condition called depression then if the current uh, covid pandemic has acted as a uh, major environmental stressor definitely both these things the genetic factors as well as the environmental factors uh, cumulatively will induce depression in that person so then moving on to some of the challenges uh, which we encounter when we deal with mental health problems in the adolescents and youth uh, first and foremost uh, uh, problem is that of uh, understanding the developmental kind of changes that happened during the adolescence uh, psychological uh, biological changes uh, that happen right from the time of the adolescent uh, phase the after completion of childhood phase and uh, especially in the adolescence uh, we see that uh, certain behaviors uh, may be very normative during that period like for example uh, some amount of uh, moodiness or uh, some amount of uh, aggressive behavior or uh, you know, risk taking kind of behavior or uh, the adolescence uh, uh, need for uh, being very autonomous or adolescence uh, as they are going growing through that phase they try to take their decisions on their own they may not rely very much on the parents or the other, other adults they may depend more on the peer influence so all these things are normative during the developmental phase so whenever we try to uh, elicit any uh, mental health issues in this uh, particular age group it's very important for us to differentiate uh, the psychopathology that is uh, any signs and symptoms related to the uh, mental health issue from that of the developmental changes also it is very important to understand that uh, there are very limited resources for help seeking for this specific age groups and uh, most of the mental health services that are available in the country are uh, addressed towards the adults and uh, there is lot of uh, awareness issue uh, that is uh, prevalent in uh, our uh, Uh, especially low and middle income countries lack of awareness uh, that is called as lack of uh, mental health literacy and uh, lack of trained mental health professionals who specifically work in these areas adolescents as well as youth and uh, of course uh, you know the very uh, important factor of stigma and uh, also uh, 
there is uh, an issue of confidentiality and lack of privacy and uh, the services uh, generally that are available definitely <clears throat> they don't uh, take care of these factors to uh, adequate extent so why to identify these problems early in adolescence or youth uh, early intervention can be initiated if we identify these things early and also this leads to better emotional behavior functional outcomes and lesser in requirement of intense psychiatric treatment uh, for example in patient care etc and also uh, it is cost effective to deal with these problems at a earlier stage and uh, these kind of approaches are best suited for low and middle income countries which are already resource poor so in terms of risk factors uh, there are a whole lot of risk factors that play out in this period uh, during the adolescence period or the youth period so we can say that uh, right from the uh, the uh, temperamental factors uh, that is in adults we call it as personality so basically the nature of that uh, particular person uh, sometimes uh, they may have some temperamental traits like difficult temperament or slow to warm up temperament uh, which may predispose them to uh, certain conditions also presence of uh, a family history of mental illness or substance use disorders especially in the parents as well as siblings uh, presence of any acute or chronic medical condition and uh, faulty parenting style uh, parents when they are uh, either uh, very permissive in their parenting style or being very authoritative and uh, interpersonal conflicts in family financial stress academic stress Uh, certain uh, experiences like bullying or abuse kind of experiences and uh, recent life events uh, and uh, presence of neurodevelopmental conditions in childhood uh, this we may see in some children wherein uh, right from the childhood they would have had uh, problems like adhd or autism or intellectual disability etc uh, these may predispose the person to develop uh, psychiatric problems as they uh, enter into the adolescence period also uh, whenever we try to discuss uh, the mental health issues with adolescents and youth it's better to use this window approach uh, first to discuss about the health and well being then address the physical health and then move on to the mental health uh, rather than directly uh, enquiring with them about the mental illnesses so some of the common disorders i have listed on this slide uh, depressive disorders anxiety disorders adjustment disorders psychosis behavioral addictions and substance use disorders so uh, compared to the adults uh, in adolescents and youth the symptoms can be uh, atypical uh, for example in depression the person can manifest increased sleep and uh, it's likely that uh, for every one person getting a diagnosis there may be around 10 to 12 people or even 15 people having what we call the subclinical or sub threshold problems because they may not meet the diagnostic criteria of a diagnosis but at the same time they will have some symptoms uh, which cause impairment in function also it is important to uh, bear in mind that compared to the adults uh, family factors especially the interpersonal conflicts and parenting related factors are much more significant in the adolescents uh, occurrence of multiple disorders together like for example an adolescent having the social anxiety along with depression or a picture where we see that an adolescent uh, had adhd from the childhood then develops both anxiety and depression as he reaches adolescence so what are the warning signs we need to keep in mind uh, first and foremost like any change in mood that lasts for more than 2 weeks and uh, being worried or anxious that uh, definitely the caregivers or parents or peers they notice that it is more than usual academic decline poor personal hygiene and also changes in the sleep and appetite changes in behavior uh, either aggression withdrawal repetitive behavior self injurious behavior etc uh, when the adolescent complains of boredom or lack of interest or concentration feelings of helplessness hopelessness of fatigue worthlessness etc and frequent physical complaints and whenever any uh, uh, consult is made with any uh, physician or any medical specialist they rule out the medical conditions all the medical investigations they turn out to be normal so we need to suspect that uh, it's uh, likely that there is an underlying condition like an anxiety disorder or depression 
and uh, death wishes, suicidal ideas, and uh, difficulty in completing the tasks. So uh, screening for mental health problem, first and foremost, we need to ensure privacy and confidentiality. We need to ask for specific symptoms, distress, and functioning. Uh, we need to obtain self-report from the adolescent uh, himself or herself, and also we need to obtain report from the parents. Uh, it is well known that uh, some of the uh, problems related to their mood or anxiety, the adolescents are likely to report themselves better. Uh, these are called internalizing kind of problems. Whereas any problems related to their uh, behavior, like aggression, self-injurious behavior, etc., uh, the caregivers or parents are more likely to report. And uh, also we can take the help of certain commonly available screening tools uh, that can elicit uh, these uh, symptoms uh, and give us an idea about the underlying mental health uh, problems. And once we do this, uh, every screening process has to follow by an immediate psychological support. We need to provide that. And uh, that's where it's important that uh, we should not wait for a formal evaluation by a mental health professional. Uh, immediately, we need to speak to the young person himself or herself and uh, support them psychologically and also provide adequate uh, uh, caregiver support. And we must remember that engagement with the uh, adolescents is a process. Uh, so it's not a one-off kind of phenomena and it keeps waxing and waning and requires constant attention. We need to speak to the young people directly and uh, we need to treat them as responsible and capable uh, citizens. And also uh, uh, one should be very empathic and non-judgmental when we are working with adolescents. Active listening is very important and we need to create a supportive space for them. And we need to establish the confidentiality and limits of confidentiality. So uh, limits include that any self-harm behavior or the any dangerous uh, risk-taking behaviors uh, that uh, doesn't come under the confidentiality. So we need to clarify uh, if they are uh, trying to communicate something rather than presuming that we understand everything. And uh, we need to do the, what we call as emotional identification. Uh, so uh, one should not attempt to understand the young person very quickly. And uh, it's better to ask and clarify what they're trying to express. And also uh, one needs to be very well prepared to address sensitive topics uh, like substance use, self-harm, sexuality related issues, etc. And also we need to uh, be present focused, problem oriented. And also uh, we need to provide education. This whole process of screening and providing the psychological support, uh, it should be very educative and uh, we should be very responsive. Uh, but at the same time, we should not take a controlling or authoritarian kind of position. Uh, some of the uh, potential threats uh, to this engagement process we need to detect and uh, address. Uh, stigma is one important factor and the denial and avoidance uh, from the young people. And also uh, uh, getting uh, into some kind of hopelessness kind of situation or uh, you know, if they outright refuse, then we will have to make some kind of safety plans for them. So some of the common mistakes uh, that are be, be, that uh, we make whenever we work with young people is not allowing enough time for them and also not ensuring the privacy and confidentiality, trying to control the discussion, uh, being very uh, judgmental or uh, preaching to the person or uh, just uh, without understanding them properly, giving them some labels and uh, not accepting their feelings and giving any premature advice or reassurance and encouraging the dependence on the uh, counselor or the therapist. So I have listed out some of the screening tools. I'm not going into all the details. So uh, these screening tools can be general uh, mental health screening kind of tools. And there are also specific kind of tools that are available, uh, which can screen for conditions like depression or substance use, etc. So uh, in the, at the school and college level, screening are brief interventions at the need of the hour. And also these have been found to be very effective and acceptable. So what is required is incorporating this kind of mental health uh, interventions or screening programs in the broader health and well-being framework. And these have found to be very effective and acceptable uh, when delivered uh, at the school and college level. Uh, I would like to end with these take-home messages. So we have a large population of adolescents youth in the world. 
and uh, this is a period of a crucial uh, phase of transition developmental period and also uh, these illnesses are very common uh, in the adolescence and youth and early education early intervention leads to better outcomes uh, so at the school and college level the mental health programs need to include screening and uh, brief intervention with that i end my presentation thank you thank you sir dr shreyashi is currently serving as assistant professor at the child and adolescent psychiatry unit at nimhans uh, she's completed her dm in child and adolescent psychiatry from nimhans and her md in psychiatry from kmc manipal she's very interested in psychotherapy and she's worked extensively with children and adolescents on a variety of emotional behavioral and mental health issues thank you so much for that introduction uh, madhurini and it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you a big thank you to uh, samagra and also uh, to uh, dr matthew vergis for um, for getting us here and for organizing this and i'm very happy uh, to be sharing the forum today with uh, my head of department at nimhans uh, dr john whom you just heard from so uh, what i will be covering uh, very briefly in the next 15 minutes is essentially the role of parents uh, in the current pandemic so um it, when it comes to the impact of covid-19 it's uh, helpful for us to remember uh, a proverb which which we all have heard of which is that it takes a village to raise a child and uh, we indeed know that this is true from from our own experience um that you know earlier there were so many caregivers that a child had especially in previous generations um there were so many people whom the child could turn to when they were in distress and many of us even before the lockdown and you know the other restrictions of the pandemic were in fact speculating about how the move you know to more nuclear families to um some sometimes to single parent families how this is in fact affected children and their development and it does seem that those same processes have now become further magnified um you know with what we are currently all going through uh, in the world today there is more uh, social isolation uh, you know there is there are even fewer people uh, for children to turn to and so in that context the caregiving burden is um completely on parents really and uh, so which means that parents have been faced with a lot of challenges right and uh, so the role of parents is is also uh, you know what responsibilities that they now have towards their children all of that has become really magnified so what i've tried to do is i've just tried to kind of list some of the challenges that parents um, have been experiencing during the course of this pandemic and then you know for us to look at what are maybe some things that can be done and you know how parents can really try to help their children um, and you know together overcome some of these challenges so the first uh, challenge really is um, you know we all know that children and teenagers have unique developmental needs so at every stage of development right from the preschool years moving on to school age children and then adolescence children um, are different they have uh, different requirements and we need to understand that and respond accordingly so uh, for preschoolers it's important now for parents to try and remember what sort of milestones um, is my child supposed to have achieved at a particular age right so cdc is a useful um, website it's center for disease control and prevention which lists all the developmental milestones that a child is expected to have achieved at different ages and it will also tell you about these milestones in different domains of development for example motor language socio emotional and cognitive so once you have an idea about what your child is supposed to have achieved at a particular age you can then try and design activities to see how to help your child achieve the next milestone that uh, he or she is uh, expected to learn now for school age children this is um a stage of development characterized by what eric erickson termed industry versus inferiority right so this is an age where children are you know um, they're exploring many new things they are making new friends they tend to um, compare themselves with their peers and um, it is in this process of industry 
right? That is in engaging um, in different activities, in um, experiencing uh, success in many of these different activities, in feeling that they are able to do something that their self-esteem also then develops. And the opposite of that, if these um, are not happening is uh, when it is possible that the self-esteem of this child may take a hit leading to inferiority. So it's important for school age children to see how can we continue these developmental processes? How can we continue you know, their acquisition of skills? How can they in some ways continue their extracurricular activities, hobbies, uh, challenge themselves in new ways, and then um, get these sort of success experiences even though things are so restricted and limited now. Now, for adolescents, I think uh, Dr. John has explained it to you so beautifully about how uh, this stage is, is so very unique, right? And in the process of uh, finding out their own identity, so the, the, the stage is called identity versus role confusion. So in the stage of finding out their own identity, there is a lot of experimentation. There could be impulsivity related to um, uh, what Sir was mentioning about the frontal lobe or the judgment centers not having matured. And naturally, all of this is going to lead to a lot of clashes uh, with parents. So it's important for parents to be aware that this is all these are typical of this developmental stage of adolescence. So they need somewhat delicate handling because they are, again, vulnerable right, um, for uh, developing mental health issues because of uh, these things. Now, uh, there is certainly uh, one thing that is on everybody's mind, and that is what is the developmental impact of social isolation? Social isolation is something that has affected us all, right? We're all used to our, um, you know, our networks, our social networks, engaging with them, um, you know, meeting our friends. And um, it, it has been difficult for everyone. But perhaps it has been most difficult for those who are at the extremes of the age group. That is, a um, you know, young children and adolescents, and at the other end, uh, the geriatric population. Because on the one hand, we have a brain that's in a very active stage of development, and on the other hand, we have a brain that is undergoing a more slow degenerative kind of process. So both, you know, uh, of these categories of individuals require a lot of. Uh, social stimulation, ideally. And so everyone's asking, what is going to be the developmental impact uh, of social isolation? And um, we can only guess really about uh, what, what could be the impact because, you know, even before the pandemic, we had noticed that for young children um, who were not adequately um, you know, mentally stimulated enough, they did have delays in language and social skills. Uh, they were tending to spend more time on screens and, and these were challenges. So these are likely to get even more magnified, right? Adolescents um, and school age children who are not having adequate opportunities uh, to socialize, it is possible that, you know, this may impact, you know, their acquisition of social skills also, right? So it's important to keep these in mind and then see how can we help them to socialize, perhaps through an online medium. Right, so that these um, gaps in their development do not develop so much. How can we engage with schools to try and make sure that to some extent social engagement is happening? So whether it's group discussions, whether it's uh, you know debates or whether it's uh, dramas, how is it possible to you know try and give all these to our children uh, so as to um, mitigate the impact of social isolation? Uh, you know that that could otherwise be quite detrimental for this vulnerable age group. Now, this is again another challenge that's, uh, you know, that's that's really confronting so many uh, parents and that is screen time, right? So I think uh, it's important to understand certain things about screen time. First of them being, what are really the, uh, what is the international consensus regarding uh, screen time recommendations? And what we do know is that um, uh, for very young children, that is between up to the age of about 18 to 24 months, screen time is not recommended at all unless it's for video calling, which, um, you know, if it's absolutely essential, then that may be allowed. For slightly older children between the age of about two to uh, five, uh, about one hour of screen time is all that is uh, considered acceptable. And that too screen time that is um, that is more uh, having educational content where the parent is also sitting parallel to the child and uh, viewing the screen with them and explaining to them what is going on. 
And of course, the reason why that we are so um, bothered really, and why the recommendations specifically target this young age group is, is that uh, again, this is uh, the age group that is undergoing a very rapid stage of development where we do not want their early developmental milestones to be compromised by screens in any way. For older uh, school going children and adolescents, the recommendations are less um, strict. Um, and um, the rule of thumb is about one to two hours. So that, that can be somewhat flexibly negotiated between uh, children and their parents. It's also important to know uh, what is the nature of the screen time that the child is engaging in. So is it uh, active, wherein the child is, um, you know, uh, is searching for information or actively engaging with the screen and, you know, trying to uh, learn something um, as opposed to, you know, passive screen time where they're just absorbing content. They're a passive recipient of content, um, um, which, which is likely to be more damaging. Right. So it's it's not that um, all forms of screen time are necessarily harmful. So a lot of the child's education is happening uh, over the screens. Right. A lot of uh, information seeking, uh, some socializing may be happening over screens. So some of that um, may certainly be considered productive. Now, it's, of course, important to understand at what time, uh, at what point, is um, the usage of screen time really kind of tipping over now into what we would then call an addiction. Now, this is more, addiction is more likely when the screen time that the child is engaging in is also addictive in the sense, um, you know, when there is a lot of instant gratification associated with that particular um, type of screen engagement. For example, if it's an online gaming, right, where the child does something, presses a button, and uh, immediately there is a result of that, right? So that gives a dopamine rush. And so these, uh, you know, uh, certain kinds of screen engagement, especially related to gaming and social media, these are more likely to cause um, addiction. And you can get a sense that, you know, perhaps your child is hooked on uh, to it is if they're, you know, um, really um, spending too much time and this time has been progressively increasing. So earlier they were spending about, you know, a couple of hours and now you're gradually finding that spending say 10 to 12 hours when they seem to get very irritated. So it's almost like the kind of withdrawal that you have um, from a uh, from an addictive substance like alcohol. So they get very irritated when they're not allowed to engage in screens. When you find that they are progressively ignoring other important aspects of their lives, uh, like for example, physical exercise. So if they're becoming so sedentary, um, you know, that they're not doing their uh, required half an hour to one hour of exercise, and then their health is taking a toll, uh, their relationships are taking a toll. These are all uh, signs that maybe, you know, this um, uh, child or teenager has uh, a, a, a gaming addiction or a screen addiction, and you know, it's time to seek help. Now, um, if you do feel that things are getting a little out of hand, there is too much time uh, spent in uh, gaming or screens, then one needs to, of course, have conversations around negotiating screen time. Now, for younger children, perhaps, you know, um, it, it may be easier to get them to abide by rules and you could uh, increase their motivation to follow the rules by having a star chart, right? So if, if uh, they're sticking to their uh, appropriate limits of screen time, then you could reward them with stars uh, to increase their motivation. For older adolescents, it might be necessary to kind of sit them down and uh, talk to them, understand what is their perspective about the screen? What are they getting out of the content uh, that they are uh, viewing online? Uh, why is it so important to them? Do they feel a need to cut it down? And, you know, kind of brainstorm with them and then gently put in your points of view. So to see them, you know, as an equal and uh, have that discussion instead of talking down to them, which adolescents uh, often resent. Now, one thing that is especially uh, important to remember in these difficult times uh, and with so much media exposure of the current uh, pandemic is to restrict exposure to upsetting media images. These have been uh, triggering for, you know, many adults as well. And so naturally children, um, many of them and their parents have told us that, uh, you know, they have become quite upset when they have viewed these media depictions. So it's important to be careful also about uh, you know, a children's access to some of this content. 
Now, anxiety has certainly um, been on the rise during the course of this pandemic. Uh, the research studies are still, of course, um, coming out, but we have like some online surveys uh, that have been done. Um, and, and certainly they have found that emotional problems have uh, uh, gone up in, in many children, especially in those children, um, you know, as Do Dr. John was mentioning, who had some sort of previous vulnerability uh, as well. So um, the ways really to, to manage anxiety, and um, here I'd like to um, just talk to you about a few points, um, you know, by an author called Dr. Daniel Siegel, whose work I'm quite a big fan of, and I would encourage uh, you to read as well. So what he says is that the first thing is to, to really see uh, an anxious child, right? So if, you know, they, they appear anxious, or they're talking about anxiety, not to be dismissive, um, you know, of their anxiety, or just kind of try, try to brush it under the carpet, but, you know, to, to give it the kind of importance that, that it requires. So to make eye contact uh, with the child, to say that I can, I can see that, you know, you're uh, looking visibly uh, worried, and, um, you know, I'm here to help. Right. And then the next step is, of course, to to see how you can best soothe the child. So um, what what will it be that that may help? Um, could you maybe guide the child through a basic relaxation exercise, help them to just slow down their breathing or help them to imagine a, a comforting place or a comforting time, you know, when uh, they felt uh, calm? And in this process, how do you give them a sense of safety? And these are um, extremely important. Now, it, it may not be always possible, especially during the course of the pandemic, for us to create this sort of a safety net for our children, because we are also troubled, we are also stressed out. There may be times when, you know, a child is um, a little upset and anxious, and we may get really angry at them, and that may end up terrorizing them further. But in that situation, it's important to later kind of go back and try to repair this rupture that may have happened in your relationship uh, with the child. And if we kind of are able to consistently keep doing this, then it leads to what we call a secure attachment, right, where the child perceives us as being emotionally and physically available to engage with them and able to comfort them in times of distress. And this is um, one factor that, that has been shown to really be associated with better um, you know, control of emotions in a child, which we call self-regulation and also in the development of uh, resilience. Now, specific uh, to this pandemic, some research uh, that I was recently reading um, that has been identified as protective factors. One is the extent of parent-child discussion on the pandemic, right? So if, uh, you know, uh, children have said that, yes, my mother or father has discussed what is going on with me. They've given me an explanation for what is happening. They've spoken to me about what's going on. Then uh, this sort of communication has, has been found to be beneficial when it comes to anxiety levels, right? So it's reduced the levels of anxiety and emotional distress uh, in children. And also uh, this, this uh, concept called benefit finding. So uh, this is not unique to the pandemic, but they've studied it in the context of the pandemic uh, as well. This is basically when there is a uh, difficult experience that someone is going through, are they at all able to kind of uh, look at something optimistic that can be drawn from it, something uh, positive that, that could be happening or something to look forward to. And, um, you know, I've, some of, um, you know, my colleagues also and some of my friends who are doctors, they've tried this with their children, you know, to kind of like sort of draw um, what, what are the good things that are going on right now um, in your life? What are the things that you're able to enjoy? You know, so like more time with parents, more time playing board games, etc. So this process of, you know, looking for a bit of optimism, looking for a bit of uh, positivity, finding some benefits in the middle of difficult situations, this has also been linked as being protective against anxiety and emotional problems. Now, uh, disruptive behaviors have also um, certainly increased. And in fact, um, many children and adolescents, they express um, themselves through anger uh, a lot of the times uh, because they may not entirely be, you know, capable also of tapping into what they're feeling. So, you know, in that sense, we, we have noticed that a lot of kids have become more angry and more disruptive during uh, the course of the pandemic. Anger is a little more difficult, uh, perhaps, to handle than, than anxiety. 
but again, the, the process remains similar. So to acknowledge the child's anger and to say that, you know, I can understand that you're angry because it makes the child feel understood. And then to maybe suggest, um, you know, uh, a few things that a child can do at that point just to calm down. So maybe to just take some time for themselves and, you know, just have some water and then just uh, do like a countdown, um, you know, to uh, uh, sort of take a step back from that charged situation. It's also important that once the child has come down to sort of talk to them and reflect on um, what was going on, right? So where did this anger come from? What was really going on? Was it just anger or, you know, was, uh, were you feeling something else also? Was there, you know, uh, some other emotion there? Um, and, you know, what did you think uh, that, that made you this angry and, you know, can you maybe think about it in a different way? So this process of reflection, um, if we're able to do it with children, it, it helps them to sort of, again, activate, um, you know, the thinking centers of their brain, which will sort of help to calm down or to dampen the, you know, signals from the emotional centers of the brain, which are often um, very, very active and very charged. Of course, um, if you have unacceptable behaviors, right, that are frequently repeated, um, you know, you have a child who's um, sort of behaving very badly towards his sibling or, um, you know, has destroyed something, then, um, you know, and you have reflected on it, but these behaviors keep continuing, then, of course, you could uh, think about imposing some consequences, that is, uh, you could think about removing privileges such as, um, you know, uh, TV time or playtime. Um, and these are some things that you could do. So the whole um, uh, concept of disciplining really has evolved over time. Earlier, it was more um, authoritarian, more patriarchal, and now it's more moved towards being very child centric, um, you know, and reflective. But I think, you know, if we're able to sort of draw from both of these, um, you know, both of these ways of thinking, then, uh, you know, we would be able to best handle um, disruptive behaviors in children. Um, this is, of course, when to seek help. So, so far, we were talking about what to do if we have children who are, um, you know, facing problems on and off. So occasional anxiety, occasional disruptive behaviors or anger, what to do about screen time, etc. But these are some of the uh, situations where uh, certainly a clinical uh, consultation should be sought. And um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because Dr. John has already spoken to you um, about this. And uh, this is in fact my last slide, but it's probably the most important because um, one thing that, that we have found and that research is showing us is that the levels of parenting stress and harsh critical parenting have in fact found to be correlated with high anxiety in children during the pandemic, right? So children are taking their cues from their caregivers. So it's very important for parents to monitor their own anxiety and, you know, the, as the saying goes, wear uh, your own oxygen mask first. And uh, this is all the more important because this is supported by research that tells us that reflective parents, right, um, who are able to think flexibly about their own relationships, you know, think about how they were brought up, about how they relate to other people, what are, uh, you know, the parents' own um, trigger points, like what, what sets them off. Um, you know, a parent's ability to do this would then um, impact their children and would allow them to nurture more uh, reflective children. So I think for a parent to remember that their self-care is really important and must be paid attention to is, um, is, is something that I would really like to emphasize. And also in the process uh, you know, of trying to absorb all this and trying to do all this, I think we must also remember that there is uh, nothing called uh, a perfect parent, really. We're all, um, you know, trying to do our best. And that's also something that, uh, you know, we must remember that, that it's all right to just be, for the time being, a good enough, um, you know, parent, right? Just to kind of tide over this crisis uh, to the best of our ability uh, and help our children um, through it as well. So thank you. And uh, I think we will now open for questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shiyoshi.
for that top. Thank, thank you, Dr. Shreyoshi, again for that talk. If there are some network issues, my colleague, Dr. Rekha, will jump in because that seems to be an issue at my end today. I think uh, both the talks were very useful and interesting. I think Dr. John Sagar's talk, especially about, uh, it highlights to us uh, the importance of mental health intervention particularly with the population we deal with, that is school and youth. It, it you know, almost perfectly fits the students who are in our institutions. So to realize that you know, most mental health issues start in during this period and uh, you know, it, it really brings out the importance of paying attention and focusing on these issues, especially at this time. Uh, Dr. Shreyoshi, there were some uh, questions. I'll, I'll read them verbatim, and perhaps either of y'all can take the question depending on as y'all see fit. So first question was, due to my busy work schedule, I do not find enough time with my child to keep him occupied. I let him have a lot of screen time and then feel guilty about it. Any suggestions to deal with this? Um, so I think um, the first thing that's that's important to remember is is you know again the age of the child. So if we're talking about a very young child, right, say a four year old uh, who is ending up or a two year old who's ending up spending a lot of time on the screen, um, if both parents are having to work, that's likely to be um, a lot more detrimental or a lot more damaging because we're talking about early developmental milestones potentially getting, uh, you know, delayed. Um, however, if it's if it's an older child um, and if the parent is able to talk to the child about, you know, uh, what exactly they're doing with the screen. So some of it may be educational content. Some of it may be a virtual meetup uh, with friends. Uh, conversations have been had with the parent um, you know, between the parent and the child about safe internet use, about how to really tackle things like, I um, mean, you know, online predator, cyber bullying, um, you know, the parent has put in, you know, some sort of restrictions to check um, what sort of sites uh, the child is accessing. And, um, you know, if that's happened, then I think it would be less of a problem, um, you know, because a lot of the times you're thinking that, okay, if a child is spending four or five hours on the screen, what is that doing for them? But if it's an older child and the time is well structured and the information that the child is deriving is useful and it's a more active, productive engagement with the screen, then uh, I think we need to be less worried as opposed to if it's, if it's a younger child, when I think um, the need would be really be to, uh, you know, think about what additional support systems can be um, rallied in to support this young child's development. Uh, by young child, doctor, which is the age group you're talking about? Up to uh, which age? Zero to six, typically. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think maybe the next question, maybe for Dr. John, uh, because he had mentioned the importance of caregiver support. Uh, so the question was, it is tiring to come up with activities to keep the child entertained at home while balancing work and household chores. How can I help my child with boredom while also retaining my sanity? Okay. So uh, I think it's very important uh, to you know, uh, give some uh, what I would call personal time uh, to themselves each caregiver has to do that and uh, also uh, the work life balance is something you know that's uh, always a struggle like uh, you know for uh, uh, especially for women and uh, who have to you know multiple uh, you know, uh, activities they have to do so working outside home when they come home also at home Definitely the household chores they will have to manage. And uh, even if they have some assistance uh, due to the COVID situation, currently we find it extremely difficult, like uh, getting help uh, for household chores also. And uh, uh, the scenario might be very difficult in uh, nuclear families where uh, 
just is the husband wife and uh, just one or two very young children wherein uh, the stress is uh, ex- extremely high for the uh, especially i would say the mothers uh, who uh, uh, not everyone uh, gets this work at work uh, at home kind of option so they will have to go to office for a few hours then they have to return that's where i think uh, they will have to ensure that uh, some amount of supervision for their children whenever they are at home and also uh, as dr shayoshi was point, pointing out uh, it's not possible to uh, achieve a zero screen time kind of situation so some screen time will be there but at the same time uh, having a, a menu of uh, non gadget kind of activities and uh, at least even if it's uh, for half an hour or 40 minutes a day engaging with the child and uh, maintaining that the kind of uh, bonding or attachment with the child is very important uh, and uh, so the child also it helps the child so this kind of uh, nurturance or attachment from the parent it uh, is a two way process it helps the child and uh, uh, both uh, myself and hi uh, shreyashi we highlighted the developmental aspects in children so it's uh, something very important this caregiver uh, you know, uh, work with the children actually work, you know parent or caregiver when they work with children at the same time as i mentioned this personal time uh, they can actually uh, you know select some hobby and uh, they can work on that and uh, so sometimes uh, especially uh, you know, uh, many parents uh, when they are approaching their uh, 40s or 50s they start uh, uh, no experiencing this phenomena wherein kids are growing up and you know we uh, get they themselves get bored after the workplace like they come home and especially in a city like bangalore it's not possible to travel and meet people very often so that's where in the home context like uh, probably some uh, you know uh, growing some plants in the balcony or uh, getting into some cooking baking activities or some painting or uh, learning a musical instrument uh, these are all uh, you know certain hobbies one can look at so self care is quite important. yeah self care is very important also taking care of their uh, own physical health and mental health uh, that is a very uh, that's something uh, very likely most parents keep neglecting and uh, uh, for example going for preventive health checkups uh, so many of uh, our people they don't do in especially in indian context i'm saying so uh, suddenly you know when uh, some health issue major health issue gets detected in the physical health uh, we get very much concerned so right from uh, say uh, 35 or 40 when uh, they cross that age going for annual physical health checkups and also it's very important uh, to keep in mind that their mental health is equally important and uh, taking support so uh, dr ayush was pointing out that it's very stressful especially during these difficult times Uh, uh talking to a counselor yeah you no know, reaching out that is very important so rather than waiting for you know the mental health to deteriorate reach the level of a disorder so whenever uh, you feel stressed out just reach out uh, seek help uh, uh, that is very important. so one other question was uh, if the parent is going through a very distressing or difficult marriage what can they do to help look after their child yes yeah uh this is something like you know the we see i had mentioned about uh, some of the family factors that can contribute to the adverse uh, mental health of the adolescents or youth uh the uh, relations uh, the interpersonal relation especially the marital relations between the parents uh that plays a very important role and uh, this is something like you know the uh, parents have to address it's a, you know uh something that needs to be addressed immediately and uh, they should not take it very lightly and uh, no uh, so they should seek help and uh, you know with uh, uh, family and marital counselors who are available and uh, also uh, if it is you know, like another uh, uh, factor is that sometimes uh, uh, these problems uh, they exist for a long time and uh, they are allowed to reach a level wherein you know it uh, becomes severe uh, marital discord and also uh, 
in the marital relationship if there is any interpersonal violence uh, and if that interpersonal violence plays out in the home context uh, especially in the presence of the child uh, it it uh, impacts the child uh, very adversely uh, so uh, they should not allow it to go up to that level so any even minor differences also uh, the couples they should seek help and they should address it and uh, of course if more serious issues are there where interpersonal violence these things are there immediately they should not hesitate uh, to take uh, the help from the legal system or uh, you know the some of the other specific uh, non governmental organizations ngos who are working uh, in this area uh, so they should not hesitate because uh, they should understand that it affects uh, not just their physical mental health it will affect their children also and uh, they should take the measures so sometimes uh, due to the cultural factors many of especially uh, you know we see that uh, the women they don't reach out they don't seek help and uh, in a society like ours where uh, uh, traditionally we see that uh, you know women are subjugated and a lot of violence is perpetrated and, uh, you know till the time it reaches the severe kind of situation they don't seek help so that's not the right thing. Yeah. thank you sir dr shreelshi uh, there was some questions about how we can help children who have disturbing dreams due to anxiety and also how to manage uh, tantrums that children might be having during these periods so um if the disturbing dreams are a new onset right and they have happened in the context of the pandemic or in the context of any uh, you know recent trauma or bereavement um you know that the child has experienced they're quite uh, recurrent and they are disturbing the child's sleep um you know then we need to again uh, you know think about uh, whether could this be some you know kind of uh, say post traumatic stress disorder or um you know maybe some other anxiety disorder i think it's best to seek uh, a clinical opinion um Uh, for that if it's uh, you know content that is very disturbing for the child recurrent and you know clearly there's a lot of um, themes of anxiety that keep cropping up um and the other question regarding uh, temper tantrums i think uh, first and foremost it's it's important to remember that temper tantrums at a certain stage of a child's development are largely considered um, well not very uh, developmentally inappropriate so if you have a 2 year old or a 3 year old who's throwing a temper tantrum that is um, simply because you know they are um, they have a developing sense of self but they do not yet have the um self control the impulse control or the language abilities to really be able to manage these new and big emotions uh, that they're experiencing so it's not something to be uh, unduly uh, worried about uh, as opposed to of course if it's happening um, frequently for older children that is those between say 6 to 10 you know when you know it's it's not really expected uh, you know in that sense but uh, again it's important to um you know like i said to acknowledge what the child is experiencing to to sort of help them label what emotion they're experiencing at that time you know to to say that okay this is anger what are you feeling right now that you know helps you to identify that this is anger because just that process of identification and labeling of the emotion you know can definitely go a long way to helping the child uh, calm down um maybe suggesting some strategies uh, you know for them to calm down at that time um like just you know stepping away uh, from the situation just drinking some water and then sort of you know sitting with them down later and asking them what was going on you know what what made you sort of flare up to that extent right what did you think or what did somebody say that made you feel this way right you know can we just understand what was going on a little bit better and try to get that you know process of thinking about the emotion um you know in place this is of course easier to do for slightly older children again we do not expect to be doing this for 3 year olds uh, or 4 year olds uh, to the extent that we can for older children but the process uh, remains uh, somewhat similar if you have very frequent tantrums um, you know and um you know you've kind of tried all of these things they're not working then you could also try um some of one of the older like the behavioral approaches that that I was talking about which were more popular previously that is basically setting up some kind of a um you know program wherein you are rewarding the child for good behaviors and um ignoring um bad behaviors or you're putting in some kind of a punishment like say a consequence 
for a bad behavior. So you could kind of use a combination of both, but right now what's more popular is, is, the, is the first approach that is the reflective kind of child-centric approach as, as opposed to a purely more behavioristic approach. Um, one more question, one more bunch of questions that have come up were in relation to COVID specifically. How to comfort a child who's COVID positive, who wants uh, physical contact with a parent, but uh, the parents are COVID negative and uh, there's an attempt at isolation. And also, is it right to say, you know, God will keep us safe when the children say that, you know, share their feelings about the pandemic? These are some of... Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, definitely this uh, particular reassurance that uh, you know, uh, God will keep us safe. Uh, uh, that uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, in a way it is helpful probably, you know, uh, if uh, uh, the family as such, if, uh, they believe in God and if you know, there is nothing wrong in praying and you know, uh, asking for that uh, spiritual kind of help. But at the same time, uh, they should allow the young person to talk about the experiences because that is very important. Uh, rather than just uh, simply saying that you know, things will get better or you know, God is going to help, something like that. So, uh, because each uh, child uh, uh, may experience, uh, you know, the issues related to the COVID pandemic differently. Uh, someone uh, whose friend who just uh, you know, got an information that his or her friend has got infected with COVID may react differently. Or someone who actually gets infected himself or herself or uh, who has uh, you know, probably seen his or her uh, close family member uh, suffer due to the COVID-19 infection or who had to go into immediate isolation or quarantine. So each of these situations actually, and also it depends, uh, in my presentation, I mentioned about uh, some of the characteristics of the children itself, their, uh, you know, their nature, their temperament. So that also determines how each child will react. And also it's very important uh, to uh, keep in mind that uh, the caregivers who are uh, the especially the parents have to be the immediate uh, support system for them and uh, have to spend some time listen to them. And uh, also uh, some of the experiences are quite normal during periods of stress. So adults have that and even children go through that. Uh, then that can be reassured, but definitely if uh, something is uh, you know, uh, significant, if it lasts uh, uh, say more than a couple of weeks and it's uh, disturbing their day-to-day -day functioning, uh, then uh, a formal support has to be taken. Uh, from the professionals. That's what the parents have to understand. And uh, it's uh, it's a very challenging thing. Like It's not very easy, though we are uh, giving these kind of suggestions. So uh, especially on the ground for parents, it has been very stressful. Uh, so the question you had asked, like saying that uh, parent, uh, when they expect that, no, the adult... Uh, wants comfort. Uh, yes, and adult has to, the parent has to hold him or her, and uh, especially younger children. It's extremely difficult and uh, yeah. uh, especially some of the scenarios uh, we have seen uh, right from the first wave onwards of COVID. Uh, say, for example, children of these frontline workers, uh, many of the frontline workers have succumbed to the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, many of them have become seriously ill. And uh, those children, actually they are with uh, some other alternate caretakers, but definitely it has been quite stressful for them. So uh, these situations are not very easy. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, even for you know, the counselors, therapists, mental health professionals, whoever it is, uh, it's extremely challenging, actually. I think, there, I think uh, the other, one other question was the concept of death. Is it something that uh, can be shared with a child as young as four yeah. uh, when someone has passed away? Right. Is that uh, okay? Other questions were... Uh, Adolescents have relationship breakups also at this time. And maybe yes. one of y'all can take one question. Yeah. yeah. So I will take the adolescent uh, relationship yeah. question. <laughs> so, uh, right. For adolescents, actually, during this period, uh, 
they are confined to their homes schools are closed colleges are closed exams have been cancelled mostly or ex- uh, like some of the exams have been postponed there is a lot of uncertainty and uh, also due to all this uh, current prevailing situation like uh, they have not been able to meet uh, uh, their uh, peer group face to face and it's been more than one year now we uh, we can say that uh, close to one and a half years uh, this situation is prevailing and uh, uh, most of them have been in touch with the friends uh, through the social media and uh, now sometimes uh, you know uh, having a face to face interaction uh, is uh, quite different from that of an interaction just chatting over the whatsapp or uh, uh, posting some messages on the facebook etc uh, so definitely the youngsters uh, they are missing that and uh, more so these relationship issues uh, like uh, during the adolescence uh, that has existed even in the pre covid situation also during covid situation it has become difficult because uh, they are unable to meet these people face to face and they are not able to ad- address the any issues that emerge in the relationships and uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, they uh, don't have the you know specific contact details of the other person also sometimes and they just uh, simply lose touch with that person so uh, these are all the situations and also uh, the uh, coping with this breakup itself is challenging during this time so any uh, you know uh, they require uh, lot of support uh, and that's where i think uh, the uh, parents or caregivers and even the counselors or therapists they have to be uh, specifically checking about this particular aspect about the relationships like you know, uh, as such uh, as how the adolescents are been handling this during the pandemic and uh, uh, specific issues uh, that require support it has to be provided and uh, like for example the breakup point which you mentioned as to how they are coping and we have to ensure that uh, they don't get into uh, unhealthy ways of coping like for example you know uh, getting into some kind of uh, self injurious behavior or uh, you know get, uh, using some substances uh, you know which affect their physical as well as mental health uh, so these kind of things uh, are not good and uh, healthy ways of coping open discussion about these kind of issues uh, providing them immediate support that is what required Dr. Shreyushi, the question yeah. about uh, death for a young child. Yeah, so um, for very young children, for preschoolers really, uh, below the age of uh, seven, it is difficult for them to grasp the concept of death, especially because they don't really understand, you know, this whole phenomenon of what is reversible and what is irreversible. um the the minds are not developed enough to be able to kind of be flexible enough to understand that this is an irreversible process that somebody who is not there may not come back right but at the same time it does not mean that you know a child who has lost somebody close to them that we can just leave this issue um you know undiscussed and not give them you know any explanation about about what has happened right so i think in very in very simple ways using see uh, yes such young children are not capable of a lot of abstraction so you would have to use very concrete examples you know of showing that you know when how say a flower blooms and then it wilts you know and then after so some time it falls examples from nature Mike. yeah you know and then we don't see it anymore so similarly um, you know about how this can happen sometimes to people also and so to give them an explanation with we sort of you know concrete examples which they may be able to understand and then it's important to remember that for young children when it comes to um dealing with grief really it it's um they also take their cues from surviving caregivers so you know to what extent is is the person who is with them now um able to support them right to what extent is that individual able to maintain their routine this child's routine in a somewhat predictable any, way any suggestions for a surviving parent a parent who may have lost their spouse uh, during uh, covid and needs yeah. to regulate themselves as well as their child do you have any absolutely so i think um, you know for again for um, the surviving yeah. parent the the only way is is really um, you know and what we call the first 
task of of mourning um, you know or or grieving is to be able to acknowledge the pain uh, you know related to to the loss and to be able to talk about it to be able to express it and go through the you know emotional process uh, of grieving all of the emotions so whether it's anger initially whether there are feelings of guilt whether there are um, the inevitable sadness um, you know one has to be able to have enough support systems in place to talk about these difficult emotions because if you know you suppress it then that's that's certainly going to channelize itself in some way onto onto the child also and you know get so um, the displaced the most important thing that Is, is for parents to reach out for help absolutely. instead of um, absolutely trying to do it all on their own to reach because out they for... cannot talk about these kinds of difficult and complex emotions with with young children so they're going to need to do it uh, with somebody else and then provide the kind of um, you know emotional support the um, um regulation when it comes to distressing moments for the child the kind of predictable routine that children need and that is pretty much all that a preschooler would need in order to get through it you know for the supporting for the surviving caregiver to be okay for the routine to be predictable and for their own distress to be met with uh, effectively as and when uh, it arises thank you i think we have uh, extended our uh, your time we've eaten up more of your time than we had planned on so thank you Dr. Shreyashi and Dr. John for you know a very uh, useful session and for speaking so candidly about these issues that I think preoccupy most of us even as mental health professionals. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Sir.